once you sort of define this as a tool in your toolbox, it's about saying what are sort of the trade-offs that I'm willing to make, right? Hello, and welcome to Human the Loop with Scale AI. I'm Vijay Karunamurthy, and I'm the field CTO for Scale. And today I'm joined by my colleagues, Sam and Felix. Sam, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Sam. I'm the head of Enterprise ML here at Scale. Uh, Felix? Hey, everyone. I'm Felix. I lead the engineering team here. Great. Super excited to be joined by you both. This month, we're diving into the foundations of AI governance for enterprises. To kick us off, Felix, when do we see enterprises implementing guardrails, and what are the types of guardrails that you see? Yeah, when we, when we talk about guardrails, it's a pretty broad term, but, but you know, I think it's pretty easy to kind of break it down into different segments, right? And so, you know, one type of guardrail is like a behavioral guardrail, right? So you have an agent, and you have some business logic that you want it to follow. Um, let's say, for example, you're an AI tutor, and, you know, normal models are conditioned to give you the answer, but, uh, you know, you don't want to give away the answer if you're a tutor, right? Because you want the student to learn, right? And so how do you put a guardrail on the behavior of the model to kind of encourage it to and prevent it from giving away something that doesn't follow the business logic rules, right? So, you know, I don't know what the proper term is, but we can call it behavioral guidance, right? Um, there's another type of guardrail, like, you know, a safety guardrail, right? And then there's other guardrails I think are a little bit more nuanced in similar subcategories. Like we have like compliance, a lot of compliance guardrails. Like let's say, for example, there's legal terminology and things like contract terms that you, you absolutely have to get right. Like hardcore, uh, if you don't copy and paste this from a contract uh, and, and re re repeat it verbatim and you have any AI synthesis over the top, then it's against the conditions and rules of the business, right? And so these are just a few examples, right? That just kind of like come, come to mind, right? And so um, these are t the types of things that we're definitely experiencing. Um, and maybe Vijay, you can you can help us, you know, go through the different categories of different things that people actually experience in in real enterprises and real real experiences that we've uh, we've worked through. That's a great overview of the different categories of guardrails that we've seen. And one of the things that we've started to see in the real world is that different guardrails have become very important for different types of customers and for different use cases where we've seen adoption. A great example of that is our partnership with Cisco. The guardrails that we've implemented for Cisco do is that they're able to detect specific categories of harms and think about ways where an IT administrator or anyone in a role where security is paramount to them can understand how those patterns are being observed in real traffic and get ahead of which roles within the organization need to be aware of those patterns or those threats. Another example of Guardrail is works we do with enterprise customers like Cengage. Um, Cengage is one of the largest publishers in the world. They are a very large textbook publisher, and they've built an AI student assistant to help students in K through 12 or in um, graduate school or, or any environment ask more deeper questions about what they're learning from a textbook. There, the guardrails can be more specific than just security interests. It can be ensuring that the the student assistant doesn't leap to an answer or doesn't ruin a, an answer that's going to be included in an assessment. There can be a range of things that a particular teacher or educator might want to avoid in a classroom setting. And we built guardrails to be able to classify that sort of behavior and ensure that educators stay in control of that student assistant experience. Other work we do in the enterprise includes work with pharma companies where they are now talking to patients for the first time, especially where there's a new direct-to-consumer business. And they need really quick verbatim answers to certain categorical information. But in other situations, they also need guardrails to help avoid conversations steering into regulatory areas. Another interesting engagement we did with, with the major publishers with Time. And Sam, I'll actually hand it off to you to talk about our work on guardrails for, for the Time implementation. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting. As you've talked about, there are a bunch of different sort of guardrails and, and focuses of guardrails sort of across enterprises. Uh, I think to talk about time in particular, uh, so we launched sort of a, a person of the year experience with time uh, back in, I think it was November. Um, and that's a really, it's a really challenging, a challenging situation, right? Because you want, you want to fully protect your AI chatbot from saying things that sort of change the, the perspective that time is trying to create. Uh, but also you wanted to engage in sort of challenging conversations, right? Um, and so our approach was essentially to have some kind of separate model that was specifically focused on guardrails, right? And this this was kind of run in parallel to our chatbot, which was essentially answering questions about sort of the, the person of the year and the article that was written. 
Um, so this kind of lends itself to to discuss a bit at a high level, sort of what are the different sophistications of guardrails? How do you actually build guardrails sort of across the stack and across the different types of guardrails that you need? Um, so I'll kind of talk through the different levels of sophistication there. Um, so at, at sort of like the fundamental level, um, you know, we we do a lot of red teaming with these with these foundation model providers, right? And so they actually are pretty good out of the box, right? They don't say the things you ask them not to say. Um, and so you can actually get away with a lot just by prompting the model to not say certain things or be or avoid certain topics of conversations. Um, and also you can just rely on sort of this post training that these foundation model providers do to make sure that it doesn't, you know, talk about something that might be harmful or something like that. So I think the the very like most basic form of guardrails is simply adding to the prompt and adding to the system prompt about certain rules and sort of regulations you want it to follow. Um, separately, I think we've also found that it can be really, really powerful to dedicate an entire LLM task to being a guardrail, right? Um, so specifically taking some of these foundation models and saying your task is to determine if this is relevant to XYZ enterprise or not, right? And this ensures that it stays sort of on topic and you can actually run this in parallel to your main LLM that's answering the user question. This allows you to sort of have the value that you want out of a guardrail um, without sort of increasing latency or anything like that. So those are kind of like the, the most basic forms of guardrails is really just around like prompting and, and changing the different behavior of these foundation models. It's interesting when you bring up prompt engineering and our work on red teaming with some of the largest models released out there. For example, we're mentioned in the OpenAI 03 model card as one of the red teaming partners that they worked with. A lot of attacks that maybe worked two years ago now actually don't work because we've done research into things like a hierarchy of system instructions. So previous attack that would say just ignore previous instructions. Now the model actually knows like I have a higher level system instruction that tells me I should respect certain behaviors or should adhere to the model spec. And so those sort of attacks don't work anymore. Um, but now today where you use out of the box guardrails from OpenAI and Meta, those are actually more complex. So I'd be interested in hearing from you, Sam, you know, what do you get with these more complex guardrail models today? Yeah, for sure. So uh, some of these providers have done some really great work of specifically training guardrail specific models. So as you mentioned, Llama Guard, um, I believe Microsoft has their own sort of protection uh, guardrail. OpenAI has their own guardrail models. Um, and these models are really specifically trained for detecting these attacks that, you know, scale is so famous for helping create, right? Um, and I think those are very, very great sort of low latency, hyper specific models to really help you have confidence that, you know, you are actually protecting against the basic threats, no matter what, no matter how sort of complex these prompt injections and attacks are. Um, and so I think that's kind of like the next level of guardrails, right? Rather than just spending time working with this prompt and relying on these, these pre-trained models that have this base functionality, you go to a provider or you, or you use some kind of hosted guardrail model that's task is specifically trained for being really, really good at guardrails, right? Um, and I think finally, sort of the last level of sophistication is actually to train your own guardrail. Um, I think Llama, uh, uh, Llama Guard did a really good job of sort of explaining the cookbook for fine tuning sort of a version of Llama Guard that's specific to your guardrails. Uh, we did some work where essentially we took Llama Guard and we built on top of that for a very specific taxonomy of attacks that we were trying to protect against. And then also created some trained models that use sort of the BERT style models as more classifiers rather than the Llama Guard based model. Um, and having this sort of like hybrid system allowed us to achieve really low latency on 90% of attacks, uh, and then leave those really difficult ones up to the smarter LLM guardrail. So that's kind of like the most complex sort of form of guardrails is something where you have this custom trained model, you have this hybrid system, and you're really optimizing for latency in a very specific taxonomy. Um, Felix, now that we've kind of talked and covered the fundamentals of guardrails, what are some of the things you've seen in practice? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, like you, you kind of just touched upon um, something that's pretty important, right? The meta point about what you're just saying is like, there's a bunch of different options, right, to do this. And like, it's not a one size all fits all kind of problem. And I think, um, you know, it's really important to kind of take a look at the space and kind of think, oh, wh wh why aren't there like too many guardrail as a service kind of options out there uh, that have that have worked? And and you know, part of our business, we've explored a ton of different offerings and and even even explored that ourselves. And our finding is like, there's two reasons in my opinion. One is that if you look at guardrails, it's pretty far down the funnel, 
right? You're kind of talking build something, uh, maybe observe it, iterate on that, use evaluations, right? And then check on that. And then you get to a point where your AI is stable enough where your legal person comes in and says, okay, you want to go to production? Here's some things that we, we want to, you know, avoid, right? And you go, okay, okay, like what's, what do I have to do now? I got to put a guardrail on it and then I got to build an eval set. And that's, so you're, you're like four or five layers deep at this point. Yeah. Do you I, recommend that as a product development lifecycle for AI to wait until the very end? To, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I think you bring up a good point. It's like we recommend bringing this up early. And, and a lot of times when we go work with customers right now, this is the first thing we bring up. It's like, hey, who, who's involved here? Let's, this, this is the stack. You got to do these five different things. Who's your owner for legal and compliance? Who's your owner for evaluations? Who's your owner for AI? Who's your owner for infrastructure? Let's get everyone in a room, let's talk about the strategy, and then we'll execute against the strategy, right? So I think it's it's kind of important to kind of look at things that way. Um, and another thing is just kind of like, you know, going back to what I was saying about like guardrails not being productized, like every everyone has their own, you know, custom, custom use case. And I think in exactly what Sam and Vijay, you were saying about the different, different uh, customers we had, uh, we kind of had to do different things for everyone, right? And so, like, even if LlamaGuard performs at, what, 96% accuracy at, at something, doesn't mean it's going to do well on your domain, right? I mean, you know, a lot of times that's trained on public data. You're an enterprise. You have, you know, petabytes of your own data. Uh, who's to say that's the same, right? And so um, I want to, you know, ask Sam kind of, like, how he thinks about uh, these different approaches in practice, like how do, like what should enterprises do, right? We kind of saw that maybe guardrails as like a catch-all maybe is not like the best way to do things. Um, how do you think they should approach these these problems? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think fundamentally the best way to think about it is just as a tool in your toolbox, right? And I think once you sort of define this as a tool in your toolbox, it's about saying what are sort of the trade-offs that I'm willing to make, right? We always say there's no free lunch in this space, right? So you have to think about sort of what is your propensity for accuracy, precision, risk tolerance, et cetera. Uh, what is your what are your sort of latency concerns? And then what are sort of your cost, your cost profile that you're willing to accept here? Right. So if an enterprise comes to us and they say, well, we just want to make sure we're protecting it against saying something really bad, then you might want to use sort of a cheaper sort of in parallel out of the box guardrail model. Right. Because these are really, really good at, at doing this. They're specialized in this. And a lot of them are really low latency and pretty small models. Right. Uh, but then we also come to enterprises who are like, we have this 99 percent uh, guarantee from our legal team. Right. That we don't do this. Right. And then we think, OK, well, maybe we should look at this really carefully. We should think about what our options are. We should even consider training our own model. Um, what we found is sometimes just generating, you know, thousands of examples as training data and then training a, a more simple sort of classifier model can do this task really, really well. Um, and that also decreases things like latency, costs in the future. Um, but it requires having very specialized enterprise data and enterprise, you know, domain knowledge. So I think fundamentally it really comes down to what is your sort of tolerance for risk? What are the costs you're trying to sort of preserve? Um, and then what kind of latency uh, options do you have when you're thinking about deploying this thing? Yeah, and I think you reference a really interesting trade-off here between um, what used to be called helpfulness versus harmlessness. So in the early days of our work with reinforcement learning team and feedback, the helpfulness harmlessness scale was a way of us understanding um, you know, where a model provider wanted to go in terms of having a model that would respond to most questions, um, but would maybe refuse to answer certain questions that go into a sensitive area or an area that the model provider didn't feel comfortable giving answers to. Um, as you fast forward three years later, that scale can be useful in certain situations, but in other situations you want a model to be creative, to be thoughtful in the answers that it give. Um, the answers that it give to just one step of a multi-turn conversation might actually be um, pretty complex if you look at the context of that full conversation. So rather than just using the helpfulness harmlessness scale, having these categorical guardrails, having the ability to understand with nuance what's being said in conversation can be incredibly important. And that can be really valuable to have agents and models that can interact in a creative way with humans rather than just shutting down or refusing those sort of questions as they come up. Yeah, that's a really good point. I actually will would like to add a fourth axis to sort of the trade-offs, which is, um, you know, what are the product requirements, right? I think, you know, fundamentally, you have PMs and directors and execs spending, you know, a lot of money trying to create really exciting products. And when you find that 50% of the time, it gives you this sort of out of the box, really lame answer. And I think like from a product standpoint, it, it's a really terrible experience, right? 
Um, and so I think you also really have to think deeply about how much you care about that product experience and how much you want to make sure that sort of your precision is also really, really high so that you're not, you know, you're making sure that you're delighting your customer at the end of the day. Yeah, a lot of this does leak into product, right? It does leak into just saying, oh, well, okay, let's let's break down the guardrail problem to multiple layers. There's there's behavioral layers, there's absolute, absolute layers, like don't create or delete anything, there's destructive events, there's illegal concerns, and um, you know, kind of like tying back to all the things that we're saying, it's like you really have to take the tools that you have, all the different options that Sam was saying, the simple, the complex, whatever, do some pattern matching, see where do they fit the best in your stack. Um, you know, also not all of these are AI problems, like the calendar one, probably not. I can just say, hey, before you try to do these destructive actions, probably shouldn't do that, right? So, or ask, ask, for, uh, ask for approval, right? You know, that sort of thing, right? These are all tools and it's a dynamic situation and I think it's really important to understand uh, yeah, uh, you know, the way that scale operates when we approach different customers is we try to educate, we try to explain this, uh, we try to do some design and, and work with them to kind of figure out what the best path is and um, make sure that we're executing something that is um, fits the problem and doesn't try to just force something on top because we think that this is a put a guardrail on it, right? It's, it's way more complex than that. Um, but yeah, Vijay, passing it back to you. Yeah, I, I love that you referenced the educational role that we play here at Scale with all of our customers and the work that we publish publicly. Um, you know, as as one of the companies that's at the frontier of how data is used for training these models, we've always been interested in how, um, as these models get more complex and they're able to handle multimodal data or handle more sophisticated multi-turn conversations, what that really means in terms of safety and the guarantee that you need. Um, you know, when RAG pipelines were first set up, we suddenly started realizing that you can introduce pump injection attacks in images that were passed in along with documents, and that would introduce a risk area that people hadn't considered before. Um, and now as we do more with browser usage and computer agent models um, like Operator or other models that are being released, um, we're starting to think through the different attack vectors that can surface there that didn't exist before. So we're constantly thinking about how guardrails can keep up with these new frontiers and new surface areas where um, you know, enterprises really need to stay ahead as they deploy the, the edge. Great, so that's all for today's discussion on enterprise AI guardrails. If this type of work sounds exciting to you, we are definitely hiring on the enterprise team. And you can come check out our careers page for openings.